Morning. Morning, James. Hopefully you can hear me. I can. That's perfect. Thank you. So thanks so much for doing this again. Um, GCP infrastructure is a very interesting fund because it's got exposure to lots of interesting little bits of the market. <coughs> so we're going to talk about some of those. I think for those people who don't know the fund well, um, can I ask you just to sort of introduce it, please, uh, for a couple of minutes, and, and then we'll ask you some questions. Sure, very happy to. Thanks, James. So, um, very good really intro to me. My name is Philip Kent. Uh, I'm a director of Gravis. I've been at Gravis for around six years and one of the fund managers on this fund. Um, in terms of the fund itself, by way of the, the most headline view, the fund targets UK based infrastructure where that infrastructure benefits from some form of public sector backed cash flows um, with a focus on debt. In doing that, we're trying to achieve three key things for our shareholders, the first of which is income. Um, in respect of the, the current financial year, the company has a seven pence per share uh, dividend target, and that represents around a 6.1% dividend yield on the current share price. And we think that's a really attractive level of income um, for the underlying risk in the portfolio. And the company has been around for around 12 years where we sit today and, and has a 12 year track record of delivering uh, an attractive income. And more on that through the course of, of the next couple of slides. I think I've said before, and, and I maintain that diversification. So the second objective that we have is a key differentiator for us relative to a number of our peers. The company's ability to change the focus of the sectors that it's targeting in response to a changing landscape of opportunities and the shifting sands of UK government infrastructure policy, I think has historically been a key enabler in maintaining the attractive yield without having to adjust our investment policy or change our leverage profile uh, through the life of the fund. Finally, capital preservation. And um, so I think being infrastructure, infrastructure by its nature is defensive, uh, has protection from real physical assets and contracted cash flows associated with those assets. I think the company's approach to infrastructure further supports capital preservation. I think in particular, our approach to dividend coverage, make sure when we're presenting dividend coverage, we're very much seeking to um, compare dividends out with income in um, by way of interest income to ensure that where we say the dividend is covered, we're not, uh, there's no implicit assumption that we're eroding the capital base over time. I think our focus on debt rather than equity and infrastructure is also uh, important in terms of capital preservation. We focus a lot on mitigating it against downside risk to make sure that we get paid back as part of our debt investments rather than perhaps creating lots of equity upsides that are priced into what are increasingly transaction, uh, increasingly competitive transaction processes. We calculated recently um, the, the annualized uh, aggregate downward revaluation that's been incurred over the 12 years since the fund IPO. So that's effectively the annual amount we've had to provide for against the portfolio. And that came in at around 0.24% of principal. And we think that compares really well with uh, relative loss given default or probability of, of default ratios for equivalent credit. I think it's worth also saying that that loss has been more than offset by upward revaluations that we've seen as a result of discount rate compression across the portfolio. And um, so on a net basis, the, the value has at least been preserved. I think the final point is as ESG matters become an increasing theme for investors, we think the company is really well placed. ESG wasn't really a thing when the fund IPO'd 12 years ago, but the fact of where we find ourselves is that the company has been investing in projects with a core environmental or social purpose for over a decade. I think the challenge for us is working on how we measure and report and verify the tangible benefits, whether that's environmental or social benefits, and disclose on those themes over the period to come. So I think you can expect more reporting and disclosure on this topic moving forward. James, perhaps we can turn to the next slide if that's okay. 
Thanks. So what I've tried to capture here is just a number of the headline benefits and I think the key attractions of the company as I see it today. I've mentioned that dividend yield on share price and so the fact we have a 12 year track record of paying an attractive income and that current level of income is over 6% we think is a really attractive dividend level. At 1.1 billion, the portfolio is large, it's well established, only 1% of that is in construction, so it's largely operational and operational uh, and operates really well. We've talked, I think, in detail um, in various publications and webinars around a conservative valuation basis that we apply, I think, coming at valuations from a debt perspective, um, particularly in the renewable sector, means that I think we're well placed on what we see as being a, an increasingly divergent scale of different approaches to renewable valuations across the market as that sector becomes increasingly competitive. And I think we're, as I say, really well placed from, uh, from being on the conservative end of that spectrum. In terms of the pipeline where we sit today, we have a, a, an attractive pipeline of investment opportunities. And um, I think that both provides potential further diversification as it looks to invest in new sectors as the UK government is seeking to support new areas of infrastructure development and supports the sustainability of the current dividend in terms of the rates of return that we're forecasting to get out of the pipeline. And that pipeline is more than sufficient to reinvest any capital that is repaid to the company and I think also to justify any potential future growth should we choose to do that. I think with inflation being a very hot topic at the moment, um, the portfolio is well placed and um, over 50% of the portfolio has some form of inflation linkage in its returns. And that's through a number of mechanics that were built into the underlying loan documents to effectively protect the portfolio on a relative attractiveness basis um, in a higher interest rate environment where I guess higher inflation would also be expected. And we've seen the benefit of this come through in the latest couple of NAV publications where updating our long-term inflation forecast with the OBR forecast has contributed to increases in the net asset value of the company. And perhaps turning to the opportunities um, for the fund for a moment, um, and I'll talk more to this in a moment, I think we are at a, a really interesting point, I think, in the development of UK infrastructure. I think we have some very aggressive decarbonisation targets looking to net zero to 2050. We also have some very live concerns currently around energy security, um, which have been brought into the spotlight with the events in the Ukraine. And infrastructure is, is definitely a, a solution or part of the solution to both of those challenges. And um, we also have the, the clear pressures around energy prices and the role of new infrastructure in addressing that, I think, is also an interesting question. But all of that, in my mind, points to significant investment requirements in infrastructure and as a fund that targets a diversified range of different infrastructure sectors, I think we're really well placed to capture the benefits of that moving forward. If we could just turn to the next slide for a moment and to touch on the portfolio as a snapshot of, of where we are. Um, the portfolio is roughly divided across three sectors. Um, around 63% of the fund is invested in renewable energy projects. And as you can see from the graphic there, that's diversified across a range of different asset classes, whether that's solar, both rooftop and ground mount. Uh, geothermal, which was one of the latest investments we made in partnership with the Eden project down in Cornwall. We have around 24 anaerobic digestion projects across um, the UK, wind or onshore projects, three large biomass sites and uh, a number of smaller biomass installations across the country and hydro projects, so well di diversified portfolio and that's really had a number of benefits over the last couple of years where we've seen some very volatile prices, we've seen some periods of pretty low wind speeds, so having a combination of intermittent renewables with baseload renewables I think has meant that we've been able to capture a lot of the benefits in the energy system and again that's been reflected in the increases to the NAV that has occurred, have occurred over the last number of quarters. The remainder of the portfolio is made up of PFI PPP at 23%, so that still forms a core part of the portfolio, and that's predominantly social infrastructure, so smaller leisure, healthcare, education, judiciary, community service type projects. 
um, that's well diversified and spread across the country. Um, and then supported living. So this is a subset of social housing seeking to support or provide social housing to individuals with a, a specific care requirement. And that makes up around 14% where we were at the end of um, at the end of March. So we're saying that's come down to around 10% since then as a result of the refinance of a proportion of that portfolio. The 1.1 billion of assets is spread across 48 separate investments. As you can see from the graphic there, there are a significantly high number of projects supporting that. Weighted average life of 11 years generated just under 8%. Um, and I've mentioned that around 1% of it is in construction. So it's a mature operational portfolio. So to touch perhaps for a moment and perhaps to segue into um, the discussion Q and A, um, if we could go to the next slide, please, James, on um, the market and I guess where we see future opportunities for the company. Um, this slide seeks to show the evolution of public sector support mechanisms for new infrastructure um, over history and going back to the 80s and 90s, the privatization of utilities and a number of those form parts of core infrastructure mandates where we sit today. Through the PFI initiative um, for, through the 90s and, and into the 2000s um, and various renewable subsidies across uh, the RO, FIT, RHI, CFD, and then the Supported People Programme as a legislative underpinning of the supported housing or supported social housing investments that we have. So where we sit today in terms of that is that PFI is no longer a scheme that the government uh, wish to use to procure new financing for infrastructure. That said, I think we do see, particularly in the devolved administration, schemes such as a mutual investment model um, in Wales and Scotland, where I think the devolved administrations are, are, are keen to leverage central government budgets through revenue support models. So there might be a small PFI-like um, put investment and uh, pipeline moving forward, but we don't expect that that will grow materially from where it is today. In terms of renewable support, the contractor difference is the principal support mechanism for renewables. The auction, uh, the results of auction round four uh, came out in the last couple of weeks, and I think that pointed to some significant deployment in areas like offshore wind. I think seven gigawatts of capacity were awarded with contracts as part of that, as well as significant awards to both onshore wind and solar for the first time, I think, since 2014, and, and supported a number of new sectors. We saw, for, I think, for the first time, tidal stream and floating offshore wind being supported as part of that. And that remains, I think, the, the key support mechanism for renewables, and I think we can expect it to move forward. I think an interesting observation from the latest auction round is that um, at the strike prices that were bid, this is not actually a subsidy being paid by the government to generators, it's expected that there'll be a net payment from generators to the government. I think one advisor estimated that would be just over two billion pounds over the life of the support mechanism. So what we've seen here is a shift from the government having to subsidize renewables by paying renewables to a world where actually renewables are paying the government for the benefit of certainty um, in having fixed price contracts with the government. Um, I think we, uh, we're aware of other models that might come into play, such as the regulated asset base. That's certainly been talked about in the context of small modular nuclear reactors. And we've seen that used in the context of Thames Tideway and Heathrow Terminal 5. I think my observation there would be that's, uh, that, that model, so the regulated asset base, works really well for larger, complicated infrastructure projects, such as Thames Tideway, but I question its applicability to more smaller social infrastructures, such as community centres, doctor surgeries, the sort of thing that I think PFI ended up being quite effective for. In terms of supported living, we've pulled new investments in that sector, I think as a result of two things. I think, first of all, the, um, the regulator issues around uh, regulators' concerns with small RPs and the long lease model, um, which I know we've talked about previously, but also I think the fact that the sector has become much more competitive and the rates of return that are available today are, are lower than they were when we started investing in 2014, 2015. And as I mentioned earlier, we've actually reduced our exposure to that sector by about 4% during the last six months. So the key question for us is in that context, what comes next? And 
what I've tried to show on the next slide is perhaps a number of themes that point to the requirement for new infrastructure um, and perhaps working from the right hand side and looking at the population dynamics, so a growing population, an Asian population, the type of infrastructure that that's going to demand around housing in the first instance, but also leisure, education, healthcare, more community based infrastructure. I think our view is that the way that's being procured and financed at the moment is very much through central government funding directly. I think the last couple of budget announcements have made significant commitments to areas such as housing and new hospitals, for example. Um, but there's a limited opportunity for the private sector to get involved, I think predominantly as a result of the ASPIRI, the PFI mechanism and nothing really replacing it. I think there's a, a question what happens uh, in the next, I think, five to 10 years as a number of the PFI schemes start coming offline and the handback provisions kick in with those contracts and whether there's some sort of procurement or tender for uh, a life extension for some of those assets, I think, again, is an open question, but to the extent it happens, it's an area that we're well placed to benefit from. I think in terms of digitalization as a macro theme, there's lots of infrastructure that that's required to support, whether that's towers or wires, and data centers, and it's an area we've looked at in some detail. I think our observation generally would be that a number of areas within that look quite congested. I think the road outside our office, um, I'm well aware, has been dug up five times, I think, for different cable providers to put um, high-speed broadband down, and then you end up in a position where the infrastructure owners are taking the demand risk associated with asset owners competing for end users, and that's not really a position we want to be in. The fund has historically been very focused on availability-based revenues rather than demand-based revenues, and that certainly um, served as well, particularly during periods such as COVID. So I think we come back to the left of this slide in the net zero transition, and I wouldn't understate for a moment the scale of infrastructure development that's going to be needed to deliver this. And that's in areas that we know well, so electricity generation, and that's where a lot of the support mechanisms and investment has focused, predominantly around wind and solar. But we also need to decarbonize our heat system, our transport system, our agricultural system, our industrial system. Um, and we probably also need to suck some carbon out of the atmosphere and store it, which is pretty core to the net zero strategy that's been published in the UK. So there's a significant investment requirement associated with that. I think the Treasury's own net zero assessment um, published uh, ahead of the COP conference last year pointed to 60 billion pounds per year of, of expenditure by 2030. And as a comparator to that, the most recent budget had 12 billion being invested in green initiatives over, over the next five years. So 12 billion in five years versus 60 billion a year, that's a fairly significant gap that needs to be bridged um, pretty quickly if we're on track to meet those targets. And we're not on track. The Climate Change Committee came out relatively recently saying we're falling way behind in some of those other areas around heat. So there's a real infrastructure investment need here if we're going to stay on track to hit that net zero transition. I think the positive thing for me is that we're seeing a number of policy initiatives to drive that. The fact that the CFD auction was significantly expanded and, and is supporting new technologies, we think is a real positive that will likely create opportunities for the fund moving forward. We're seeing new schemes implemented, such as the Green Gas Support Scheme to promote the biomethane as a decarbonisation um, approach to, to the gas grid. The, the UK Emissions Trading Scheme is, is now a year old, having replace the EU scheme, and that's a UK government price for the cost of emitting carbon applicable to certain industries. And with carbon prices today at around 80 to 100 pounds per tonne, I think we're working with a number of industrial um, participants in that scheme that at those price levels, it makes significant sense to start making capital investments to abate emissions, which I guess is exactly the point of the scheme. There's some other areas where the government are providing support directly, so EVs, for example, by way of accelerated capital allowances or just upfront grant support. And I think there's certain examples where the fund will be able to benefit from that. So perhaps just turning to the next slide for a moment, um, I think the fund we think is really well placed to, to benefit from these new sectors associated with that infrastructure investment requirement. The fund has a long track record of getting into sectors early and capturing enhanced risk adjusted returns um, before sectors mature and either risks are better understood 
or competition drives yields down. So we've been investing in domestic rooftop solar in the UK um, since 2011. We've been investing in anaerobic digestion and biomass since 2013 and 14. Um, similarly, with supported living, we're one of the first investors in that sector since 2014. We're one of the first pure financial investors in the offshore wind sector um, with our investment in Race Bank, which we disposed of last year at a 12% premium to, to our holding value at the time. And more recently, in the project I alluded to earlier, um, the investment we made in what is the UK's second deep geothermal project, I think the first institutionally funded project in partnership with the Eden project down in Cornwall. So we have a long track record of successfully getting into new sectors, investing in those sectors early before returns compress, um, and then um, diversifying into new areas once existing areas become less attractive. I'm conscious of the time, so perhaps, um, James, if it's all right, I'll pause there, um, and I don't know if there's any specific questions. Um, I'm very happy to, to keep talking, if not, but uh, perhaps I'll pause for any Q&A that, that, that you or others might, may have. Cool, great. Thanks, Phil. Um, I suppose there's, there's, a, there's a basic one here that we should address. So um, in terms of the competition, so um, you're lending money to these projects. Why aren't banks doing that? So the fund, going back to its origins in 2010, was set up really in response to the, the financial crisis where the founders of Gravis saw the opportunity as banks were retreating into core lending sectors, which at the time infrastructure wasn't, to offer investors with attractive income against long dated government backed cash flows. And really that was the origin of, of GCP, the fact that banks were withdrawing from um, set alternative investment sectors like infrastructure in response to the crisis. I think what's happened since then is it puts us in a slightly different position where we are today. Um, I guess with lots of talk about challenging times potentially ahead, it's, we've gone out and spoken to a number of our, our relationship banks and um, the project finance banks. And I think the position today is actually banks see infrastructure and particularly renewables as a pretty core mandate for them, that actually there might be more of a flight to safety in response to a crisis and perhaps withdrawing as we saw um, going back to, to, to 2010. I think that, so, so to your question, why aren't banks lending to these projects? I mean, in certain cases they are. So for example, the commercial bank lending market, the institutional debt market for uh, sectors such as solar, offshore wind, onshore wind is pretty active. And we, in the work, the interest rate environment that we've existed in for the last um, six or seven years, we just haven't been able to compete with senior debt um, rates of return in those sorts of sectors. So I think we've moved more into subordinated debt in those areas, taking more of a, an equity-like risk, I think it's fair to say in certain cases. Um, I think in the other response to that has been to look at new sectors such as biomass or anaerobic digestion and acknowledging that we and others have had challenges in those sectors. I think where we sit today, we have around 80 million of AD and 150 million pounds worth of biomass within the portfolio that actually all operates pretty well. So that's a really good position to be in. And I maintain that both of those asset classes have pretty core cool roles to play in the decarbonisation of, of, of our economy. Um, and I think supported living is another good example of where you know, where we're unable to compete in, in perhaps sectors like PFI or more established renewables, we've looked at other areas of support. And I think that's exactly the challenge for us today. You know, banks aren't lending to the deep geothermal sector in the UK because it's relatively nascent. The scale of opportunity that we see today is not sufficient for banks to, I guess, put the cogs in motion and get their credit committees on board with, uh, with a new sector. So I think by getting in early and, and capturing, capturing the market before banks plough in and we have to look at more subordinated structures or filling gaps between equity and senior debt. Um, that's, I think, where we've been able to, to participate. Okay, thank you. When, I mean, when you are lending to something that is a brand new risk, if you like, something, something like geothermal, how do, how do you go about deciding what the right price is for the debt that you're supplying? How do you, how do you actually do all the sort of due diligence required to, to work that out? The first thing I say is that in no way would I, or I think any of the team pretend to be experts in 
all of the projects that we invest in across all of the different areas of a project. So um, it, any due diligence for a project will cover legal issues, property issues, commercial issues, insurance issues, technical issues, finance tax issues. We're not all experts in all of those areas across every sector we invest in. I think the job as I see it for us as an investment manager, and particularly going into new areas, is to make sure that we're working alongside advisors that have good track records in relevant sectors and um, so have the relevant expertise whether that's in technical matters in the insurance arrangements in the financial tax accounting treatment of the new sector um, and that that work is comprehensive and ultimately puts us in a position as the investment manager to fully understand the various risks that we're exposed to in making a new investment and can put an appropriate price on those risks and ultimately what we're trying to get to is I guess put most simply is how volatile are the potential cash flows that we're lending against I guess that goes to can how how technically variable might the operations be in the outputs of the plant be what are the market parameters around which the project relies what's the tax liability and what's the risk embedded in the assumptions you're taking for that so ultimately you know, and lots of others so ultimately we're aggregating all of that information from a bunch of advisors and um, we're we're making sure that that's comprehensive the advisors are the right people to work with and then understanding that risk and putting a price on that risk um, so i think but i think the first thing there is accepting that you can't be an expert in one of these areas and in the same way for sectors that we've, we've invested in lots um, such as wind i think we'd still as any other investor would work with lots of very specialist advisors to to opine on different things and every project is different so every project you know i've never worked on a project where the property hasn't had some quirk around mine and mineral rights that have been reserved by um by someone that you can't speak to so there's, you know, there's always challenges and every project has to be looked at uh, as a as a unique project and the due diligence has to respond to that okay thank you um obviously interest rates are going up as we've been talking about this morning um does that change things in terms of you know, the dynamics of new investments yes i think it does i think there's a number of areas that i would touch on there i think the, the point i made earlier that 52 percent of the company's portfolio has some form of inflation linkage so to the extent as i think is happening interest rates are rising in response to inflation means that there will be some excess income outturn from the existing portfolio i think perhaps looking forward i think there's there's a couple of things i'd say i think we're already seeing um higher interest rates in senior lending and um, so where projects are relying on senior debt financing that's secured on a floating rate um, that cost has gone up for long dated debt and i think the interesting dynamic there coming back to sort of the market position is um you know, the people that won CFD contracts this time around, and perhaps if we look to say the Crown Estate lease around for offshore wind, I think we are in a different world now potentially to when participants bid in those. We've got financing costs going up, we've got capital costs in a lot of cases going up, and I think that will put pressure on the equity returns available to investors who have participated in those kind of auction rounds at, I guess, fixed outcomes. Um, so financing costs going up and um, potential equity challenges. I guess the, the, the probably the biggest potential impact to the company is the fact that higher interest rates may ultimately flow through to increases to discount rates used to value the portfolio. And um, if the say 15 year guilt is taken as a proxy for the risk free rates that discount rates are calculated off. And um, I think the comments I made there is we haven't necessarily seen that happen yet. Um, I think these are liquid assets and I think it will take time for those sorts of increases to flow through in benchmark transactions that the fund has an independent value and Mazars and ultimately it's up to them to assess those benchmarks and, and apply on the discount rate that's used in the valuation. Um, perhaps the other counter to that would be the fact that I don't think these asset classes are getting any less competitive. So uh, we're in a world where, as I mentioned, I think a flight to safety is seen as generally perhaps investing more in infrastructure or more in renewable assets and particularly with more sustainable investing strategies, ESG strategies, I think the demand for these assets isn't going away. And I think uh, I think a likely outcome here could be that whilst there's some 
increase in the risk-free rate driven by interest rates, actually the margin over the risk-free rate compresses, and you end up at broadly the same place, just driven by competition. Perhaps the final thing to say on this is that the fund IPO'd in 2010 in a very different interest rate environment. I think the 15-year yield was around 4.7% at IPO. So actually, if we're back in that sort of world, the fund is much better able to, to compete with commercial lenders whose costs have just gone up. And um, I think that might mean that the fund's cost of capital hasn't changed, so we're actually getting safer assets and taking less risk to get the to get to the level of return that perhaps we've had to where interest rates have been much lower and as i mentioned earlier that might have pushed us into more subordinated structures rather than perhaps senior secure structures which leads us straight into the next question so what's the split mm -hmm. actually between subordinated debt and secured debt and senior secured debt so i think it's roughly 50 50 um across the portfolio so senior secure senior um, and subordinated yeah okay great um but I, I suppose a question that sort of friendly comes up, and it's not actually listed here, but I, I'll ask it anyway. How do you end up with some equity-like returns within the portfolio that you've got, given that, given that it is loan-based? Sure, there's definitely a question that comes up and one well worth addressing. I think there's a couple of reasons. I think the first is that as lenders, where historically there has been underperformance, we have, in certain cases, taken the decision to step in and enforce against an asset and take control of that asset. So the outcome of that process is that um, we, or the fund is the owner of a project. And in that case, we value it as an equity holding. And there's been some really positive stories. I would sort of emphasize associated with where we've done that, where we've stepped into assets and, and the performance of those assets as a result of our actions has materially improved. Um, so, so that's one area. I think the other area is probably driven by the theme I referred to a moment ago where in a world of very low interest rates, I think to achieve the returns and in some of more, the more established sectors, we have taken more equity like positions in the capital structure. And I guess subordinated debt is, is, is fine, but you've got to accept where perhaps there comes a point where cash flows aren't sufficient to support that subordinated debt it is effectively becomes equity and we value it as such. Um, so I think, and in some cases, particularly in offshore wind, uh, onshore wind and solar, we have got or, or invested in loan instruments that effectively pass through the benefit of higher inflation or outturn electricity prices through to the underlying coupon on the debt. So, so there's an equity like risk profile to those loans. Um, so, so the portfolio where we sit today is probably best characterized as a bit of a mix between, on one hand, what people I think would see as true senior debt, which remains well covered and, and is current and, and, and serviced, and we have no, no limited variability with the valuation outside of the discount rate used to fair value that debt changing. Um, and then we have a portion of more subordinated, um, subordinated equity-like exposure elsewhere in the portfolio. Okay. So against that, then, um, to what extent do uh, does the NAV vary with things like gas and power prices? It does. Um, we've presented, I think, as part of the interims and an annual report. Um, and if anyone would like this information, I'm sure we'd, we'd be very happy to share it uh, or refer to it. Is it does vary. The two key sensitivities are really outturn inflation. Um, and electricity, wholesale electricity prices on the renewable portfolio. And we've got sensitivity analysis against both of those. Um, clearly, given the debt nature of the portfolio, it's, it's not entirely linear. So there's a point where, in my example earlier, subordinated debt is returned to par and any further increases in, I guess, the enterprise value of a project go to equity rather than debt. Um, so it isn't a linear correlation like I think a number of our equity peers in the renewables and infrastructure sectors provide, but we do present the sensitivity nonetheless. I think the other area that's potentially you know, relevant given the discussions on um, the conservative leadership bit at the moment, and we've certainly seen impact the company over the last two or three years is corporation tax and um, the extent to which corporation tax rates changes that does affect the cash flows being generated at a project level and ultimately the project's ability to service um, service its debt or ultimately it just goes to the value of those those investments okay um 
everything you've got, I think, is in the UK. What would would you ever go outside the UK to for making investments? Um, we have looked at it, and it's an area we we continue to review. I think the um, the fund is always, has always has a UK mandate, um, and we've remained very disciplined in doing that. I think the way I sort of see the waterfall of of how we would approach investing is that the first the first investigation for us is almost can we diversify in the UK and then new areas of infrastructure support that we can move into before having to almost step outside of our existing mandate, um, which we we have a twenty five percent out of scope allocation which we 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 could do do that as part of. But I think where we sit currently is that we see more than enough opportunities in a UK context and um, without having to to go abroad and i think we'd only ever do that if we could justify the benefits of that change in risk change in mandate to our investors um, and i guess in a world where uk opportunities were drying up and we wanted to reinvest capital and we saw attractive opportunities in say europe then I th that could be a scenario where we made the case i think the world as i see it today certainly is that um the European infrastructure market is as, if not more, competitive than the UK's, and therefore, um, you know, I don't, I don't think there is a massive amount for us to gain by going into new geographies. PPP still exists in a number of European countries, so you know, as an example, but the rates of return achievable on that are significantly under the the rates of return we're getting on our current pipeline of investments in the UK. So. It, there would have to be a very strong driver to do that, which I don't see existing today or indeed in the near term. Um, and I think the impact of moving away from a pure UK exposure, moving away from our mandate, introducing FX risks or the risks associated with hedging into the portfolio is would have to be offset by a significant benefit. And I just don't, don't see that in the near term. OK, fair enough. Um, I think you said you've got 1% of the portfolio is exposed to construction risk. What's the attraction of having that in the portfolio? I think the attraction and historically that number's been a lot higher. So if we went back four or five years, it'd probably be closer to 16, 17 percent. The attraction is, I think, one where you can investing at a construction stage allows you to get into projects earlier to I think structure the project in a way that is optimal for you as a lender um, and and make sure you're sitting in the right part of the capital structure, the project agreements, whether that's the agreement to build the asset or to operate it or to of take the use of the asset um, all up for negotiation and you can insert yourself in those negotiations and, and make sure you get the right protections um, so the risk is, is appropriately transferred. And, and the rates of return are simply higher because there is always an incremental risk associated with construction, whether that's associated with delay or cost overruns or just what's gonna be built is not what you think is gonna be built. So, and obviously you can try and manage those things as part of of contractual protections, um, which we absolutely do, but ultimately, to the extent those protections fail, or to the extent you're reliant on credit risk of the counterparties underwriting those processes, and I think InterServe in the last four or five years has been a really good example of where that can go wrong, then um, you know, the construction stage is a more risky stage to invest at, so the rates of return achievable are, are higher. Uh question just popped up here about dividend cover so um how do you how do you think about dividend cover and, and is the dividend covered and um what's the sort of outlook for that sure so we do have quite a lot of detail um on this i think the short um the short answer is that yes the dividend is covered the way we assess that is looking at the interest income accruing to the benefit of the fund so the contractual interest that becomes due to the company under its debt investments in a period. We deduct the fund level costs, um, so the financing costs, the operating expenses, and we get to an adjusted net earnings number, which we compare to the dividends paid. In the six months to the 31st of March, we recover by, I think, 105 times. And, um, and that's very much the basis of the assessment that we've used in setting a 7p dividend is what we think is a, a sustainable, stable dividend over the medium term. Um, I think we're conscious that, that that is different to how a number of peers present dividend coverage. I think a lot we see a lot of 
a lot of peers presenting an operational cash flow from a portfolio of equity investments and comparing that with dividend coverage. In my mind, that's, you know, that's I mean, you have to understand it for what it is, but ultimately that operational cash flow needs to pay back your day one investment as well as underwrite your return. I think the way in which we differentiate between income by way of interest and principal, on the assumption that principal is repaid as part of our debt, uh, I think make sure that we're comparing like for like by comparing effectively interest in with income out by way of dividends. There's a lot more detail on this point in the annual report and the analyst presentation. And equally, if, if anyone would like a conversation on this specific point, I'd be very happy to, to talk to it in, in more detail. Cool. And then just one last one, I suppose. You've got a fairly chunky investment pipeline. Um, would you think about growing the fund to absorb some of that? Or, or is that just there to, to replace things as they mature? I think we'd love to grow the fund to the extent that we've got accretive opportunities in the pipeline to do that. I think the question whenever we're, we're, we have cash is whether that's us proactively refinancing or restructuring a project or um, or going out to raise capital is what do we do with the capital. And um, I think where we sit today, we have an accretive pipeline that I think is accretive both in terms of income to cover the dividend, but also uh, additional diversification for the underlying asset base that we think is attractive. So, um, and, and obviously the, you know, the share price and NAV dynamic needs to be supportive of an issuance, which is probably in the challenge that we've had over the last, uh, last six months or so as the NAV has, has continued to increase. So, um, but it's one that is on, under constant review, um, but we'd only ever take that decision to the extent it's accretive for existing investors uh, in terms of diversification, dividend coverage and quality of the portfolio. Great. Thanks very much, Phil. That's really helpful. Um, I think we better stop there because <clears throat> we are nodding up against 12 o'clock. But um, we obviously published a note recently, so there's, there's more information in there. And um, if anybody does have any, any questions, they can always email me and we'll pass them on. But thanks very much for your time this morning. So um, we will... Just a couple more slides. We're going through the results. I could. Um, we've been... Busily arranging meetings, as I said, I think there was, there was a sort of paucity of, of uh, guests last week, but um, there, there isn't any more. Um, and I think we've actually got one for the 5th of August too, but I haven't put it in here. So um, we'll be back next week talking to Stuart Woodson, who's the manager of Odyssean, and um, Andrew Hattie will be doing his roundup of July, slightly earlier than, than normal, but that just sort of fits in with holidays and things. Uh, and then we will be back on the 5th of August, and I think we do have a guest lined up now as I said, and then all the way through. So that there's no summer break in here. Um, but of course, who actually presents this is going to might vary from week to week. So thank you for your time this morning and um, we shall see you again next Friday. Thanks, bye-bye.